Hello, Eastridge Chapel class. Um, I am happy to be with you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you did not get a video last week because I uh, took a vacation. Um, and I didn't want to do a video from the Smoky Mountains uh, because I was with my family, my parents, and took my, my wife and kids, you know, that seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, and we went to um, Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge um, and had a blast. Uh, the kids were in heaven. They got Nana and Poppy time. We got to do the Alpine roller coaster thing. Um, it was a good week for us. Good week for the Smith family. But I'm back and I'm super excited about um, renewing our, our video series. Today, we are going to shift our felt board stories. We've been in the Old Testament. We've been in Genesis and we're going to go back um, to the Old Testament, but not today. Um, this morning, what we're going to look at is the triumphal entry. Uh, we're going to look at this beautiful, powerful, uh, emotional moment. It is, it is, uh, it's a moment that I think sometimes gets glossed over for us. Um, the reason for that is because we use um, the triumphal entry a lot of times for, for kids' classes, but that's really kind of what we're doing in this series. We're taking some of those felt board stories and trying to, to get from them, to glean from them value um, that maybe we haven't gotten yet because there's tons of it there and specifically value for us as adults uh, living in America in 2021. So let's talk this morning about the triumphal entry of Jesus. Uh, I'm going to start exactly where I hoped you would expect, in Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, we're going to read Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah predicted that the true king of Israel would come to Jerusalem on a young, unused colt. That is significant because that's what's going to happen. This is the fulfillment of this prophecy happens in the triumphal entry. Um, when kings came into cities in times of war, uh, they would come in on mighty war horses. Uh, terrible steeds is a word that I read. Um, so it's like, that sounds, that's a mean horse, right? A terrible steed. That's like a horse that's packing and has like an eye patch. Um, that's a terrible, maybe has some tattoos. Um, that's a terrible steed. That's what I was reading about, um, this week. But, but, but kings would come into, in times of war, times of, of political uprising and upheaval. Uh, you were coming on these big horses that were war horses. I don't know. You've seen movies. You get what I'm saying. Uh, but if a king came on a donkey, it meant that they were coming in peace. Um, so there's some significance to the animal that's chosen here. It's not just a, a lot of donkeys in the Bible. There's not a, uh, there's not a, 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 there's not something there that we want to, we want to, want to gloss over. Uh, the fact that he was riding on a donkey was a sign of peace. So that's, that's an important thing. Um, and like everything that Jesus did, what was about to happen was going to be contrary to what people expected him to do. I want to remind you, we get to the triumphal entry, that uh, the expectation of a lot of the people in Jesus' day was that Jesus was there for political reasons, um, to overthrow the oppressors, the political oppressors. Um, and, and that's important to keep in mind because as Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, again, it signifies uh, that he's here in peace. This is not a political uprising. Um, this is a spiritual moment and a spiritual awakening. Uh, so let's set the stage for our conversation today. I'm going to be in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you. Where you are entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. Uh, so those who were went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Uh, okay, so we're going to pause there for one second. Um, there's there's a, a theme, there's a lot of themes, but there's a theme that I want to focus on for just a second that starts at the triumphal entry. Um, and as we're having this conversation about the crucifixion, uh, we want to identify this theme for our kids and we want to be sure that we remind ourselves. We I think we academically as adults understand this, 
but we want to make sure that we're seeing it for what it is. And what I mean by that is the theme we're, we're talking about here is this was all a script. It was all part of a script. Um, this was not happenstance. Uh, Jesus was not a victim of this experience. Um, this was the chosen method for the redemption of mankind. Um, and this moment, go find the donkey, that's where he's going to be, signifies to me, um, and maybe it signifies to us, that this was, uh, this was all part of the plan. And I say that because I think if we don't remind ourselves at times um, that this was a choice uh, that God made um, for his people, for us, um, then I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. And I think we need to focus on that. All right, so I want to move, though, to verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. It's a cloak saddle, and they throw Jesus on the cloak saddle. But then in verse 36, as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Um, okay, it's a weird scene. So we got a cloak saddle, like I just mentioned, and then you got cloaks laid out on the road. Why? This was a sign of homage. These people are paying respect to Jesus. So I want to start our conversation, our takeaway this week. I want to start it right here. Um, to say that we should respect Jesus, as the people in this moment did, is certainly an understatement. But it's a conversation that I don't think we have very often. Um, how do we live a life that respects Jesus? We, we, talk about, we talk about a lot of words as they relate to Jesus. We talk about, about a lot of things and concepts. But we don't have a lot of open dialogue about how do I live a life uh, that respects Jesus. And I think what we see in this in this moment is a reflection of the necessity for us to live a life that respects Jesus. Um, so what does it mean? What does it mean to pay respect to Jesus in our personal life? I think it's a vital question. And I think as Christians, um, we need to consider it. And we also need to be able to explain it um, to our children. Uh, they don't need to only hear what to do. They need to hear how to do it. So let's talk about respecting Jesus for a minute. Um, I think there are a lot of ways that we live a life that respects Jesus. Um, I think first and foremost, the most important word as it relates to respecting Jesus, um, we pull from how we, how we elicit respect from our children. Okay, what I mean is, how do you know your kids respect you? Um, they listen, and they're obedient. Obedience is a word that we bristle at a lot of times, um, for a lot of reasons, but we bristle at the word obedience. How do you respect an authority? How do you respect power? Uh, you're obedient to it. Uh, the authority and the power that I want to respect most in the world is Jesus. And we respect his authority by being obedient to the things that he's told us to be, the things he's asked us to be. We respect Jesus by being consistent in who we are as Christians and letting that consistency show in the way we live our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so obedience meaning... Um, we're not, we're not Sunday, Sunday morning Christians and Sunday morning Christians alone. Um, obedience means not checking our faith Monday through Friday or Friday through Saturday night. Um, obedience means being consistently godly as often as we can. Now, now, it's a high bar, and it's a bar that none of us can really, really reach, um, but the goal is to try as hard as we can. The goal is to be uh, as intentional as possible about, about obedience. So how do we live a life that respects Jesus? I think the answer is, is obedience. And as we're thinking through it, <clears throat> obedience to the scriptures, obedience to Jesus, obedience to his commands, um, uh, viewing it as respect and viewing it as an attempt to respect Jesus um, might change how we view it. And it might change how vital we feel that it is. And it's definitely a good conversation to have with your kids. We want to respect Jesus. We also respect Jesus by, by, by learning more about what those things are we're supposed to be obedient about. I think we respect Jesus uh, by study, by, by reading. Um, we respect Jesus by uh, diving into his word and trying to find as, as, as specifically as we can um, what we're being told to do as, as Christians, as citizens of this country, as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers, as sons and daughters, as, as, as neighbors, um, as employees, as, as employers. Uh, I think we respect Jesus by deep diving 
um, into that. I also think we respect Jesus in the way that, I mean, I'm going to use the parent-child relationship again. How do you respect your parents when you don't live in the house anymore? And when you're grown, you respect them by continuing to ensure that you communicate with them and that they're a part of your life. I think you respect your parents by visiting them, calling them from time to time, um, by staying connected. And I think we respect Jesus in the same way. I think we respect Jesus by living a life of prayer, uh, by living a life where we come to Jesus um, we, and, we, and we talk to God about, about our needs and about our, our hurts and about our wants and about our, our thanks and the amazing things we see around us and the blessings that he's bestowed upon us. Um, I think we respect uh, Jesus by, by not only communicating with him often, but being grateful uh, for the amazing blessings that he has bestowed upon us. Being grateful is a, is, a, is a massive part of respect. So it's a weird word to use, that we want to live a life of respecting Jesus. But I think in the triumphal entry, this first part, we got cloaks, <clears throat> cloaks on the road. I think we have this picture of respect for Jesus. And that's what I want to challenge you to do today. But that's not all I want to challenge you to do today, because there's something else coming in verse 37, or moving through verse 37, uh, that is going to really be my challenge to you. So let's move to, to verse 37. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I love that sentence. These people are rejoicing. They're celebrating. And Jesus' answer when he's told, hey, calm your people down. His answer is, I, I could, but, but there's so much to be joyous about. There's so much to rejoice in right now that if I quieted the people, the stones would have to start screaming. Um, I love that reaction. And it's the second part of this passage. So we're looking at the triumphal entry. It's the second part that we just read tells us a little something different. It's not just about respecting Jesus now. It's also about celebrating Jesus now. And it's kind of a weird word when you think about it. Um, how do you celebrate a win? For those of you, like myself, who went to ACU, how did you celebrate our first ever NCAA tournament win? If you're like me, by like fist pumps and, and excitement in a room all by yourself, because it was almost midnight, my whole family was asleep. Um, it was, I was exhausted, but it was just me. Um, and I was super excited. That's how I celebrate a win. How do you celebrate a win when you're with people? High fives, right? I don't know, chest bumps maybe? You know what you do when you celebrate a win. Um, how do you celebrate a birthday? You've got a plan for that. You've done it a bunch of times. Well, party hats, uh, there's cake and candles involved. There's gifts. Um, how do you celebrate? And then I could give you a bunch of different milestones. How do you celebrate graduations? How do you celebrate um, marriages? How do you celebrate... You get the idea. How do you celebrate life milestones? We have clear and concrete answers. Now, how do you celebrate Jesus? How do you celebrate Jesus? Not just how do you respect him, but how do you celebrate the Savior who died on a cross for your sins and as a result of that sacrifice has guaranteed us eternity? If you don't have reason to celebrate, no one in history has reason to celebrate. We have reason to celebrate... Um, but I think sometimes we forget to do it. Uh, reverence for Jesus is vital. Uh, respect matters. And, and living with a reverent respect is crucial. But sometimes we as Christians get a bad rap for being too solemn, for being too emotionless. Um, and this comes off as judgmental. This comes off as, as hypercritical of anyone who would choose to do things other than what we have described them to be doing appropriately. Uh, we get a bad rap for that. And I think the reason for that is not usually because we're super judgmental or because we've, we, we view the world through this critical lens, although that happens sometimes. But I don't think that's the main root of why the outside world's perception of, of Christians is sometimes that solemn, stone-faced, judgmental perception. I think it's, it's because we don't celebrate enough. I think it's because we don't celebrate Jesus enough. We need to teach our kids to do the same. Um, so how do we celebrate 
Jesus? That's a question I actually asked last night. I met with the Young Marys group, and we asked that question. How do you celebrate Jesus? Oh, that was a good conversation. Um, how do you celebrate Jesus? Some of the answers that they came up with was really powerful, were really powerful. One, um, we celebrate Jesus by finding joy in the world around us. Um, I think we look around um, the world that we're in, the blessings that we've, again, been bestowed upon. It's like the third time I've said that now. That means that maybe it's important or I'm just on repeat. Um, but I think we find joy in the blessings around us. We find joy in the relationships around us. I think that's a way to celebrate Jesus. But that's kind of an indirect, I celebrate the things Jesus, um, or celebrate the things God has blessed me with. But let's talk about celebrating specifically Jesus. What's the easiest, most accessible way to do it? We worship. We celebrate through worship. Um, I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm confident. I'm not the only one guilty of from time to time kind of rocking back and forth through our song services um, or thinking about how I don't really, I don't really know this one. I don't really like this one. Why do you skip verse three? Um, I made that comment last night and Jacob Thomason goes, what is this verse three you speak of? We don't, I'm not familiar with it. It's one, two, four, right? Um, we celebrate we celebrate Jesus through worship. We celebrate Jesus through song. But, but how often do we, as Christians, just not celebrate in our worship? We, we're very, um, out of respect, we're solemn. Um, and we forget that worship is meant to be a celebration, that our songs are meant to be a celebration. Um, I, I love, one of my favorite things to hear on Sunday mornings are the, the, louds, the loud vocalizations of someone who's not a very good singer. There's like one or two people I'm literally thinking of right now. I'm not going to use your names. But I love it because you know what I love about it? you just joyous and just singing. Um, you want to see joy in worship? Watch little kids. Watch little kids when they're, when they're singing uh, uh, church songs. Watch we talked about this last night. Watch Gabe Norris when his dad is leading. That is joy. Uh, kids bouncing around. Um, it's beautiful. And I think for us as, as Christians, I think sometimes we forget that we're supposed to celebrate Jesus. And worship is a really good way to do that. And, and, and so I'm talking about the existence of us being in worship, and that should be a celebration. But let me take it, uh, let me take it back, pan back just a little. Not only should it be a celebration to be involved uh, and, and engaged and connected to our worship to sing, to sing out um, because you're celebrating, not because you know all the alto notes or because you're a great tenor. Um, singing out because you're here to celebrate Jesus. So that's, that's, that's the once you're here part. How about we celebrate Jesus by literally attending church? Um, the last year has been really weird. Um, and it's given a lot of people a really good excuse to stop prioritizing this. Um, and it's given people a reason to say, you know what, we really like our Sundays at home. It's just, doing it online is fine for us. And doing it online means oftentimes, maybe well, once every couple weeks we'll check in or watching a little bit here and there or putting it on while we're doing other things so I can see the service, but I'm not really have to connect it to it. Um, I'm not... I don't want to sound like I'm a minister at a church and I want people here because that's that's what we're supposed to to do at Eastridge. I, I want I want to sound like a like a Christian who's begging you to prioritize the celebration of Jesus by being together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, don't get me wrong. If there's a health reason that you need to be at home and watching online, then, then God bless you and do that. And, and I hope you're protected. And, and but I hope but I hope you haven't lost the value that you see in us attending together. We're meant to celebrate Jesus. It's really hard to do that. I'm not saying it's impossible to do that, but it's, it's hard to do that if the, if the service is on your TV while you're in the kitchen um, or if the service is on your iPad or your phone while you're taking a walk and, you know, doing chores. Um, say that because celebrating Jesus is about a lot of things. Maybe you have different answers. Maybe you celebrate Jesus in different ways. That's great. This would be a good time to have a conversation with your family about how do you respect Jesus? How do you celebrate Jesus? Uh, but, but what I want to leave you with today um, is that it is absolutely vital 
for us to celebrate Jesus and to see excitement um, on each other's faces uh, at, at nothing more than the celebration of our Savior. Um, when, when a team that I support, that I root for, wins a game, um, I know what to do, and I do it. Um, but oftentimes, uh, that instinctive reaction is slower or non-existent when it's time to celebrate Jesus. So for the next week, we're moving into Easter. Uh, this is one of the few moments where our culture celebrates Jesus. Not in the way it once did. Um, it's not as ubiquitous as it once was. I get that. The culture's changed. Um, and there's time for us to have that conversation. But, but for now, here's my challenge to you. Um, you got a week until Easter. Every day this week, think consciously about celebrating Jesus and then try to do it. Think consciously about how you and your family can celebrate Jesus and then engage with that behavior, with that activity. I challenge you today to celebrate Jesus. We got a week. We're going to get to Easter. We're going to really celebrate on Easter. Um, at Eastridge, we're doing something a little different. We're going to have one service in the morning outside. I, I, I want that to be a celebration. I want, for those of you watching this video, I want that, that song service to be heard in neighborhoods around our church building because of the joy uh, that, is, that is evident in our words and in our voices, not because of the perfect harmony, um, but because of the joy that we experience. For the next week, I challenge you to celebrate Jesus. Figure out how to do that <clears throat> and then engage with it. And I think uh, we will have taken the triumphal entry um, I think we will have pulled something out of it uh, that for us as adults sometimes lies dormant. Not because we're bad people, not because we don't see the value in it, but because life gets really busy. And we stop prioritizing things. And when life gets really busy, celebrating Jesus is one of the first things to go. So that's my challenge to you this week. Respect Jesus, celebrate Jesus, uh, and I'll see you on Easter um, for a big celebration.